yeah I'll, I'll stop talking about girls i'm not sure where their organs go I'm not i'm not trying it's not like i'm trying to sell them on the black market or something i just genuinely wonder <laughs> yeah so what have you got for me this uh this week should i do the intro first or do you just want to plow straight on no no definitely you should do that sorry i'm having a senior citizen moment Hello and welcome all into the MO podcast. As always, you're here with me, Consumatious Ant. And me, Atreya. And today, normal service has been resumed. We are all fully aware I don't believe in any of Atreya's shenanigans. <laughs> and uh, wow, wow. we'll be talking about facts this week. That being said, I did have a dream last night. And I've consulted the Oracle, and uh, your mom? yeah, it doesn't sound good. Oh, are you going to die? Well, yeah, I don't know how many I've got left in me now, because uh, I had a dream that my teeth fell out, and uh, if any of you out there know about dreams, that means death. Really? Does it really? Death or foreshadowing of bad stuff, apparently. I mean, there's a really big difference between bad stuff and death. Like, you know, you could go to Asda for a multi-pack of Pom Bear and they haven't got any. That's bad stuff. It's a bit different to to death. I I mean, I suppose, but if you ask the Oracle anything, she'll go straight to the worst thing. Death. Uh, (laughs) Every time you have a dream, your mum says, means you're going to die soon. So, before all the November nonsense started and someone decided to go for clickbait that didn't happen let's not mention names uh we were gonna discuss the (laughs) suicide quote marks of van gogh but as there is a uh (laughs) as there is something on near me about van gogh i'm gonna wait to (laughs) see that before we talk about that so this week we're gonna be asking the question of who put bella in the witch elm Oh, Nick, I love this one. So, who's Nick? Well, just one of my friends. Oh, okay. He was like, why don't you do Who Put Bella in the Witch Arm? And he said that like a year ago. Okay. Well, we, we, we're keeping current. We listen to yep. you out there, people. <laughs> uh, I mean, you may not like it the way I did it, but whatever. I'll get him to review it, don't worry. <laughs> no shit. I may have to redo my notes as we go. Uh, (laughs) So, on the 18th of April, 1943, a skeletonized body was found inside a hollow witch elm trunk in Hagley Wood, which is just 10 miles outside of Birmingham. Now, the body was found by four boys, Robert Hart, Thomas Willits, Bob Farmer and Fred Payne, who were basically, like, just... (laughs) I mean, what what do they do it now? What do they call it nowadays? Chefs do it nowadays. Uh, scavenging, is it? <laughs> scavenging. Yeah, where they where they go into the woods and try and find food for like actual like organic ingredients and shit. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, okay. fucking fancy chefs go out. Not beefy chefs, like proper chefs go out and try and find truffles and shit. But these boys were doing it because they were starving, and it was the war. Uh, yeah so rationing was going on food was scarce and they were either poaching or looking for birds eggs to try and eat and Bob Farmer climbed this witch elm and he saw something shining that was white in in the middle of the witch elm which was hollow he picked it up and to his horror, maybe, he uh, he found it was a human skull rather than the white of an egg. And <laughs> How disappointed was he? I mean, well, I don't know, because, I mean... Uh, well, I'd, he was really hungry. Yeah, I mean... Not Can't that, eat a skull. Not that he could have ate it, yeah, I suppose. So it'd be like, for fuck's sake. Uh, so, <laughs> basically, because this part of Hagley Wood was actually on 
owned land they were trespassing and if they got caught they'd kind of be in trouble so they decided to keep it between the four of them now i don't know but it's a human body that's in a tree and it'll be our little secret yeah i mean that 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 kind of thing can give you ptsd kind and and i think it did because the the youngest boy thomas willits he he let the side down and he grasped them all up the very next day uh <clears throat> that didn't last long i know yeah he couldn't live with himself apparently can't hold his own shite can he yeah uh i mean they were teenagers they weren't they weren't boys yeah. like children yeah. but they were old enough to be able to trust and keep a secret but clearly not obviously thomas let the side down and uh, old Bill turned up the very next day in the forest and they found the skeleton, but it was minus a hand. The hand was found nearby on the floor and the body had been wedged in to the tree trunk. The police also found a blue suede crepe soled shoe, an imitation... Blue suede shoe. Uh, but this is what I thought, right? But it is... <laughs> It is interesting that it's described like that because they actually, the police did track down where the shoe was sold. It was sold in a market from Dudley and all... So not Graceland. <laughs> all but six of the purchasers of this shoe were tracked down, which was, I mean, that's pretty decent going for the police. I don't know. How many people buy blue suede shoes? It's not something I would ever buy. Primark could have them on offer for a quid and I still wouldn't buy any. I mean, Maybe they only sold, They might have only sold 12 pairs. Strange people that are wearing fucking blue suede shoes. Right, I'm just going to say now, Elvis is my personal hero, so don't let us be slagging off blue suede shoes, yeah? Oh, you just move from meatloaf to Elvis. It's next weekend, Gary Glitter. <laughs> I went there. You want to be in my guy? No, I don't. I don't get it. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you just keep Rolf and Jimmy in your gang and keep them the fuck away from me. <laughs> uh, You're not their type. I could have been back in the 80s. I was a cute kid. Anyway. You're for a cute kid, but okay. Uh, so as well as this blue suede shoe... They found an imitation slash cheap wedding ring. Now, I've got issues with this cheap re- wedding ring that comes up a lot in this research. I paid 120 euros for my wife's wedding ring. I had a feeling you were going to say something like that. You skimped out on your wife's wedding ring. Do you know what? I didn't realise until two years after we were married how much you were supposed to spend on it. And I went, forget that. Wow. And they say romance is dead. Yeah, no, I didn't even... I just went, I'll have that one. And then give it a... And it fell off. And I went, shit, do you need to size things like did, that? Did it turn her finger green as well? <laughs> no comment. Uh... <laughs> no, but what I like... It was the war. Like, people couldn't afford fucking expensive wedding rings. Exactly. That's it as well. And I think this is what we need to kind of remember. This is all being played out during the the World War Two, and She could afford horrible shoes, but they couldn't afford a good wedding ring. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, the, upon further investigation, they found a piece of satin slash taffeta. I just love saying taffeta. Uh, a <laughs> piece of material stuffed in her mouth, which was... They, because the body was too far gone, it was too like skeletonized. This is what they kind of landed on as she was suffocated by this this bit of taffeta shoved down her throat. Now, the autopsy was carried out by Professor James Webster, who established that the body was that of a female. She was five foot and a bit tall. She'd given birth at some point in the past, and she'd been dead for at least eighteen months. Oof. So that, yeah, so it was, the thing with the skull is that it had a little bit of skin still left on it with a little bit of hair remains, but 
it was proper skeletonized. There was uh, predation done, and she'd been in there a long time. So, I mean, that would put the the death in around about 1941. Uh, so she'd been in there quite a while. And this tree as well was like 35 metres away from one of the main paths. So it was off the beaten path. It was in the forest kind of thing. Mm-hmm. There wasn't... You had to know it was there kind of thing. Or you had to be really, really hungry to be trying to find bird's eggs. Uh, so Just as well those guys were. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Oh, she could still be there to this day. Uh, so... Professor Webster couldn't really give a cause of death because everything had gone too far, but he was adamant that it was murder because no one... Why would you crawl into there? The body had to be put in before rigor mortis had set in, so, like, you've got a two to four... Well, two to six-hour window before the body starts uh, stiffening up. So she had to be malleable to be able to get in there. And... It was in the summer of 1941 when her time of death was kind of theorised. There was a police report that someone had heard a woman screaming in the area. But obviously, as the tree was so far off the beaten track, no one's going to think about looking in a tree but if it was so far off the beaten track why not just like leave her on the path or behind the tree because at the end of the day the animals are still going to eat her and there'll be nothing left of her anyway or they'll drag her bits of bits of body in different directions and scatter her across the forest so yeah but this is kind of the thing that because it was the war major cities were getting bombed so Birmingham, obviously, being a major metropolitan area, was kind of getting it was getting bombed. So a lot of people had moved out of the city centre and they'd moved to the suburbs, mm-hmm. like 10, 15 miles away. So there may have been a lot of traffic going through this area that you wouldn't have nowadays because obviously people are city centre living and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So maybe the person that put them there or put Bella there, thought they didn't want to get caught and they wanted to hide it. I mean, there's easier places to hide her than sticking her in the middle of a tree, though, right? Exactly. And, I mean, on the flip side of that, it's like it's the war as well, so people were going missing and dying and stuff, so... Yeah. Mm. Uh, But, yeah, that's that's, that's just speculation. How did they fit her in the tree? Just like stuff they're in. So basically, with the witch helm, it it's got a really it's got quite a wide bar, uh, wide trunk. So this one, it it must have been a dead tree because the trunk was hollowed out. So how it got hollowed out, I don't know. But Sounds they soft. must have just like climbed up and just gone, bloop, dropped her in. Uh. That's it's kind of hard thing to do to drag a body up a tree and rub it in. Not not the lightest yeah. things in the world. Bodies are they? They don't call it dead weight for nothing. I wouldn't know. I would. I would. I wouldn't know. I mean, is there something? Well, well I mean, they call it they call it dead weight. They don't call it dead weight for no, now, do they? Personally, I don't know. I'm not going to admit to anything on the podcast. But if you are, fair enough. Uh... <laughs> I've seen enough movies to know that people can't move up. I've done enough easy. Google research too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll just say that this person or people had the strength to shift a dead weight and lob it into a tree. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the police were hopeful because that they could identify this person because the skull did have some irregular teeth. One tooth looked like it had been professionally pulled out. And there was there was some crooked teeth, so the police reached out to dentists in the local area to see if anybody knew anything about this, and they actually went nationwide just to try and find out if 
any dentist I'd worked on her. But unfortunately, there was nothing they could come up with. And because, again, it was wartime, people were going missing and things were happening outside of the police's control, this case kind of fell down to the bottom of the pile. Up until about... Nine, uh, up until a couple of years later when a bit of graffiti appeared on the side of a building and it said who put Lubella down the witch elm now this was in Old Hill which was five miles away from Hagley Wood and over the next couple of months this question started reappearing around the area and it kind of, it was basically the same, but it got shortened to who put Bella down the witch elm. And yeah. the graffiti was too high up on these buildings, on these places to be, for a child to do it, for uh, someone to be messing around. So the police assumed it was an adult. And the last piece of graffiti that was actually recorded, which was on Hagley at Oblesk, was in 1999. So... It's not Ooh. died down. People do want to know who put no. Bella in the witch hell. Now, nothing else really happened until about 1953 when the newspaper, the Express and Star, received a letter from Anna from Cleveley. The letter is dated November 18th, 1953. And it says, it starts out, My dear Quaystar, who... Quaystar was the pen name of a uh, a local quote marks journalist, Lieutenant Colonel Wilfrey Byford Jones, and he he wrote local articles and he just started writing about the Bella in the Witch Elm case. So the letter continues: finish your articles, re the Witch Elm crime by all means. They are interesting to your readers, but you will never solve the mystery. The one person who could give you the answer is now beyond the jurisdiction of earthly courts. Don't know. Don't know why. They've gone like a cult you know, on it. Just yeah. Said he's dead. Uh, <clears throat> the affair is closed and involves no witches, black magic, or moonlight rites. Much as I hate having to use a non diplom, I think you would appreciate it if you knew me. The only clues I can give you are the person responsible for the crime died insane in 1942 and the victim was Dutch and arrived illegally in England about 1941. I have no wish to recall more. Anna. Why was she not like... So I'll give you really, really specific details so that it's very easy for you to find out who it is, but I just can't be asked to give you... Yeah, I mean, it's... This letter is a little bit, some may say, unbelievable. Well, yeah, if you're going to use a non diploma anyway, then why not just say the person? My issue, my issue with it, in 1953, which brummy housewives even knew what a non diploma was? Mm -hmm. And earthly courts, why, why are you being all, like, mysterious about it? Yeah. Uh, Do you think they were a writer? A lot of people have speculated that Quaystar, uh, Wilfred Byford Jones, actually wrote this letter. And yeah. he, the way he describes it, then you just think, oh, God, you're just not doing yourself any favours here. Because he, he put out a message in the, the paper the very next week saying, oh, Anna, I need to meet you. We need to discuss this. If you know something of a crime, we need to get the police involved, etc. And she she wrote to him uh, personally and said, like, don't don't publish this, please. But according to Quaystar, he kind of she sent him this James Bond kind of "I'll meet you at dawn" and all this kind of thing. <laughs> Basically, she, from what Quaystar writes. He's like, right, she said to me in a, in a pub called the Dick Whittington pub and in a place called the Priest Hole, which is basically like, I mean, as funny as it sounds, it's basically just the, the 
the kind of snug that they have off the main bar. Do you know? I mean, as if you're going to meet somebody in secret, you meet them in a pub. That's not. Like, I'm going undercover. Meet me in spoons in half. An this hour. is it. Uh, this is it. <laughs> it's not how it works. And as he recalls, he was sat there, and in the space of two minutes, at least twenty women walked in, and he had to deduce which one was Anna. So he just went round, and the first person he saw, he felt this feeling, and he went, Anna. And then that's <laughs> that's that's how they uh, that's that's how they got to her. But he he also puts in like just stupid stuff like he says there was three boys instead of four that found uh bella he he gives the date of her being found as the actual date of the murder which was 18 months previous so it's like i I don't really think he knew anything about this case and then to try and get some ratings he wrote a letter and saying saying he was Anna. Uh, so yeah, I mean to be honest with you, there is a statement that Una Hansworth gave to the police, and she is believed quote marks to be the Anna in this letter. So it goes on a little bit, but basically the gist of it is. Is her first husband, Jack Mossop, met a Dutch man called Van Ra in nineteen forty. Now it it is it does seem a little bit espionagey, a little bit thrillery. But this is what the police have as statements. So this has been taken from the police archive. So we know this is a statement that was made by someone called Una Hansworth according and it's in relation to this case so basically van Rael had no particular job and every time she asked this van Rael about his job he didn't want to talk about it and because he had a lot of money on him at the time she kind of thought oh he's into something dodgy maybe he's a spy granted it was the 40s he was dutch he was in england maybe he was a hooker yeah you know what? He could have been anything. Maybe he just didn't like talking about work outside of work. Yeah, or that. A lot of people don't. So he, oh, did, did, you did say he didn't have a job. And every time she asked him about work, he didn't want to talk about it. Like, yeah, how many times do I have to say, I'm in the fucking doll queue? I don't want to talk about it anymore, okay? Yeah, I mean, she didn't know what his job was. All right. So, and every time she asked him, he got defensive about it, which... Again, he could be in the doll queue and going, I'm fucking out there hunting eggs with me, with me four boys. It might, <clears throat> it might work like in a women's like underwear shop or something like that. It, like, it's, it like, might be embarrassing, you know? He might he might have worked in like Anne's. Could be a rent boy, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, All it's, that, yeah. It's, there's a lot of things he could be before you jump to spy. Yeah. Uh, Especially if you were a spy... You wouldn't be like, I don't want to talk about my job. You'd have a backstory you'd ready. Like, <laughs> you would. You'd, be, you'd have the most boring backstory so that people were like, okay, I don't need to know anymore. That's fine. Yeah. We'll and you'd have Thanks. receipts and references and go, if you don't believe me, check them out just so you know I'm not a spy. <laughs> he, he's either the shittest spy in the world or he's not a spy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we find out he's the shittest spy in the world as this story <laughs> continues because in March or April 1941, uh, Jack Mossop had gone out drinking with Van Ralt and, quote, the Dutch piece. When, yeah, but when the Dutch piece passed out, Van Ralt told Mossop to drive to a wooded area where he placed her in a hollow tree, saying that she would come to her senses in the morning. Wow. So, that's not... There's, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of things to take in here. <laughs> just, <laughs> just when somebody's when somebody's like drunken out of it, you just stick them in a tree and you're like, they'll be all right in the morning. Yeah, I've never... <laughs> put them to bed! Yeah. Or put their hand in a but like a bowl of water or something or draw a moustache on them but you don't stuff them in a tree and go it'll be fine should be all right and 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 who knows where like van Rel, i know where this hold out tree is this will be funny 
watch this. We've got to carry her up, though, Mossop, so uh, you just keep the car running. <laughs> uh, s- oh, my yeah. God. So, apparently, like, she didn't come to her senses in the morning, or if she did, she was stuck. But by December of 1941, Mossop had completely, like, lost his mind. Now, Una had broke up with him, and on one occasion when she returned to the house that they previously lived in to get some prolongings, he confessed that he thought he was losing his mind, and he kept seeing the woman in the tree and that she was leering at him. He held his hand, his head in his hands and he said, it's getting on my nerves. Am I going crazy? And he was because in June of 1942, Mossop was taken to Stafford Mental Hospital where he died two months later. Right. That's what we have to go off from someone who was a... I'm not going to... I don't know how much Quasar had to do with this but it does sound like it's some kind of spy epic novel yeah, here. it sounds terrible that guy was no more a spy than you are a demonologist exactly whoa <laughs> <laughs> yeah i bet he paid like the equivalent in the 1940s of a 30 quid course that took him you know 25 minutes to do I'm gonna rise above that but yeah uh, Mate, Ed Warren is turning in his grave right now. Knowing that I'm, you've, I'm gonna, you've got that qualification so easily. He was self-taught. Self-taught. Do you know what? Do you know what? I'm going to speak to him later. going <laughs> to get the Ouija board out and have a good chat with him. Uh, where, where do you think I did my prep from? I, he coached me on it. You're a demonologist. <laughs> Thank you. I That's know. That's not like... That's that's no, not summoning I, I, the that's not summoning spirits. That's that's all about demons, dude. Do, this, do you pay attention matter. to the course? Doesn't matter what you say now. I'm just going to edit at, edit it at you're a demonologist. Fuck my life. And then we'll just end there, right? Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, join the queue. <laughs> so, the, what's interesting to know as well when this statement was taken and when Quasar got these letters <clears throat> it was 1953 now Casino Royale the first James Bond novel was released in 1953 the war had just finished I mean there was all these sensational stories maybe coming out about heroic spying efforts so I don't think it's that much of a stretch of the imagination just to drum up some kind of writing credentials that Quasar may have come up with this Mm -hmm. and maybe he prepped Una with this statement. I would say so. It doesn't sound even remotely believable. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. No matter, even if you're a good or a bad spy, why are you going to put someone in the middle of a tree just because she's passed out? (laughs) Yeah, that's just, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope the times that... Thankfully, the times I've been passed out drunk, people have just banged me in a taxi and just gave the taxi driver my address. Literally, anything could have happened to me. I don't know. But I've never ended up stuffed in a tree. And to be honest, if I woke up the next day and I found myself stuffed in a tree, I'd be really pissed off at my friends. But I don't think I'd be dead. Exactly. Uh, so, and as well, it doesn't make any mention of the blue suede shoes and the taffeta that ended up down a throat. Exactly. So, That's sus as fuck, really, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the police couldn't confirm any of the information that Una had given them, and Bella is still unidentified, and unfortunately, she's going to remain unidentified because they lost her fucking remains. How do you lose a body? A body? I don't understand that. So... After the autopsy, post-mortem, was carried out by Professor Webster, he basically sent them to a colleague of his at Birmingham University. And because they weren't authorised tests that he wanted to run, there was no paper chain involved with this. 
So I don't know whether he just kind of forgot about it and just went, nah, or no one cared. Don't know. But her remains are unfortunately uh, gone. Do you think like his colleague came in and was like, um, them, you know, undercover bones that we were unauthorizedly testing uh, the other night. Do, shall I send them back, parcel force, or what do you what do you want me? <laughs> um, yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Where are they? Uh, I put them in the bone bin, the bone bin. <laughs> yeah, you know where we where we keep all the bones for safekeeping. Right. What colour is the bone bin? Um, I think it's blue and black. That's the fucking cardboard bin. And it went out <laughs> yesterday. Well fucking Fuck done. Yeah. <laughs> like, is that what happened? It, it pretty much could be. Or there could be a flip side to this. And there could be a box in somewhere in Birmingham University labelled Bella's Bones. And one day we'll come across it. it, it They're definitely in the bone bin. I probably would think someone just came across them and went, who the f*** is keeping bones? Or do you think they have that many bones there that they're just like, well, more bones. Let's just put these on a shelf and forget about them with the other 120,000 bone fragments we have. Or maybe or maybe it's like they just, you know how you like clean out the fridge, the workplace fridge at the end of the week. Yeah. And someone just got to Friday and went, no one's claimed these bones. They're going in the bin. That's <laughs> They've been it. in lost property for like 30 years now. Nobody's come and, cl- and collected them. Let's just fuck them off. Put them in the bone bin. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so she's never going to be identified. Well, maybe she will be one day. Hopefully we'll find the remains. Uh, Professor Caroline Wilkinson did recreate a death mask and she was the lady who did Richard III, that king that was found under that car park. Oh, don't. Just don't. I can't even. So... They just threw him under a... I mean, they didn't throw him under a car park at the time. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Put him here, behind the council car park. But he's the king. Doesn't matter. We didn't like him. (laughs) It's like fly tipping Queen Elizabeth. (laughs) We're we're not Plantagenets, bro. Put him under the council car park. Do it now. We're all Henry Tudor. We're Team Tudor, okay? Just fucking do it. (laughs) I feel feel bad for Uh, (laughs) But yeah, so she created this, uh, this death mask and you can kind of, it's online, you can see the face. And to me, she looks a bit like Victoria Wood. Yeah, I know. So uh, she was that. Out. Yeah. Okay. Lovely in her own way, I will say. Yeah. Uh, sure. For sure. Yeah. There was there was speculation as well in this case about it being uh, witchcraft involved in this case and. Uh, there have been cases of witches imprisoned in trees and the hand not being connected to the body was a major factor in this because it could be represented as a hand of glory. That sounds so wrong. I know. I wish. I wish. No. <laughs> no. The amount of times I've wished for a hand of glory. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, Do you not think, right? Okay, so... How could they not tell that the hand had been cut off? Because say the remains was like so, you know, badly, like, you know, because they've been there for that long. Maybe you couldn't tell. Maybe maybe what happened is, right, they'd they'd like gagged her and thrown her down this the tree. And then she reached her hand out like, we're not going anywhere, get me out of here, I'm in a tree. Like through a gag and grabbed onto like one of their coats or something and the only way that they could get it free is by cutting a hand off because I don't think it sounds like witchcraft I just don't know I just it sounds like it to, to me and it might this might get real dark real quick but it sounds to me like a rich person like a rich bloke fancied her a little bit like took her into the woods like tried to have his rotten way with her and then when she wouldn't, or, or maybe he did have his rotten way with her, and then when, you know, she was like, that's 
proper fucking shit of you. I'm going to, you know, tell people. Then he, like, stuffed his silk hanky in her mouth, gagged her, and then threw her in the tree and just, like... Maybe he, like, knocked her out or something and threw her in the tree and then left her to die. See, now nowadays, yes. I don't think witches think... carry silk hankies or, or bits of taffeta, do they? So, uh, so the taffeta actually came from her undergarments. See? See? See, yeah. So, so that nowadays, nowadays that would be the first lead. You'd go, this is clearly sexual assault, mm-hmm. and she's been strangled with her own knickers, kind of thing. Yeah. But back then, it, <laughs> look, the past is a different country, as we all know. And even though it's not that long ago, there were, I'm going to say quote marks, but in the area, there were. I'm not going to say witches' covens either, but there were instances of people believing other people were witches. So there's like there's a case. Anne Tennant, I think, was yeah. Anne Tennant was her name, and then in oh 1875, she left to buy a loaf of bread, and she met some farm workers, James Haywood, who was quote mark simple minded he stabbed her with a pitchfork excuse me claiming that she was a witch and belonged to a coven of witches in the area Uh, Charles Walton he was also killed this was actually after the fact but it was he was killed in 1945 and his claims of witchcraft involved with him in the 40s yeah, yeah, and the thing, and the thing about the hand- issues, really, didn't they? You'd think, but apparently the villages around there at these times were closed villages. One of them, if you oh. walked into a pub, they'd all put their pints down and look at you. I mean, it's like uh, that in central Birmingham now, mate. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I suppose. don't think I'll get stabbed with a pitchfork. I might get glassed in the face, mm, but yeah. I mean, the thing is as well with the Hand of Glory, it it's sorry, <laughs> it's yeah, it's not used in the way that you'd think it'd be used in, but it's used as a uh, by burglars. So there's an actual Hand of Glory in Whitby Museum, and there's a manuscript from 1823 that accompanies it, and it tells you how to make one, and it reads thus. It must be cut from the body of a criminal on the giblet, pickled in salt, and the urine of man, woman, dog, horse, and mare. Oh, jeez. Yeah, it's very, very specific. Uh, Smoked with herbs and hay for a month, hung on an oak tree for three nights running, then laid at a crossroads. Then hung on a church door for one night, while the maker keeps watch on the porch. What does it do? And it... If it... And if it be that no fear hath driven you from the porch, then the hand be true worn, and it be yours. To do what? So what it actually, to, what it actually does is burglars use it, because apparently there's there's a few things about it. But if you burn one of the fingers outside of a house that you're planning to burglarize. It will then immediately put everyone in that house into a coma. But if you can't burn the finger, then someone's awake in the house. Right. So. Uh, but that wouldn't have worked with Bella's hand anyway, because she wasn't a criminal in a giblet. In a giblet? In a giblet? Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. She, she wasn't a giblet criminal. The scene? No, she wasn't, she wasn't a giblet criminal. She, was. she left them giblets well alone. She wasn't a criminal in a gibbet, so that wouldn't have worked at all. So, Yeah, and they left the hand behind. So what the fuck yeah, use is that? I just, I'm not buying witchcraft. Uh, but but this, is how, this is how deep it kind of ran it down there. So and I mean, there's a war going stupid. on. you got Nazis knocking at your door and you're having fights about witches. Grow up. Yeah, I mean, I think the the worst, the worst, like, kind of, not excuse, but the worst, or the most random one I've seen is Joseph Jacobs. He was the last person to be executed at the Tower of London. Yep. How he was a spy and basically 
Clara Baula. Terrible, terrible, that. Uh, but Clara Paola was an actress and a music hall entertainer. And as soon as he, he... She apparently was Bella. She'd dropped into... Parachute dropped into England. And she did actually do... The reason why she this is kind of a thing is because in the 30s, she worked at some of the music halls in in Birmingham and apparently she spoke with a brummy accent you couldn't she wouldn't hear an accent if she if she spoke she was apparently Dutch and nobody could pick up on her accent because she worked around there much and Joseph Jacobs he was besotted with her and he was like oh no I will join you I will join you over there but the thing where it falls down with Joseph Jacobs is on his first fucking spy mission, he broke his ankle. Wow. So he's there going, yeah, I'm going to join Clara and we're going to be part of this massive spy ring in Birmingham, <laughs> obviously. And he twisted his ankle on the fucking jump from the plane. And when he landed, because he'd never done a parachute jump before rolled over on his ankle, broke his ankle, and then he's lay there in this farmer's field, and the first idea he has is, I'm going to fire off my gun to get attention. Wow, super spy extraordinaire. Daniel Craig only wishes he was this guy. Exactly. And then, like, the farmers came, and they were like, what's up with you? (laughs) And I don't know what he said, but he went, right, we're getting Dad's army on this. And Sergeant Mannering came out and basically <laughs> sent him to the Tower of London. <laughs> and I think oh, what an idiot. The, the only link there is, he, he has to this case, is because oh, he's the last person to be executed at the Tower of London. That, and he was executed for treason. Uh, he was caught by Ashwald and shot. But Lots of people were executed for treason at the Tower of London. Exactly. But he was the last one because then they moved it to Pentonville and they had the hangman there. Uh, I think I prefer it at the Tower of London. It's to go out of a bang, uh, isn't it? Well, you're going out. Does it matter where? Yeah. If I'm going out, I want it to be at the Tower of London, dude. Fucking hell. All right, well. Put me on to... Tower Hill. I want a French swordsman. I have to tell me teeth that, won't I? <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, that's the... The most te- tedious link I've ever come across it is, yeah. about it. It's like, and there are some places where you go and try and research this, and they're all set up for it's. It was Joseph Jacobs that did it, and you realise how bad a spy he was. He was worse than Van Rall, <laughs> putting a drunk woman in a in a fucking tree. She'll be fine. Yeah, I think this was, as you said. It was just someone trying to get away with something. And because there was war going on, they could clearly get away with it. Yeah, I think it was it was quite clearly rape and then murder. Yeah, yeah. And and I feel bad for they, Bella, even though that's not even remotely her name. Indeed. Uh, I, think, I think as well with the graffiti, the graffiti, I think, I don't necessarily know that they knew her i just think it was something that they wrote yeah and they thought sounds good that yeah i'm gonna keep doing that they knew the basics of the case because it had happened in that area so they knew the basics of the case and they maybe they wanted justice maybe they wanted to keep her alive maybe they did know her and they they wanted justice for her but they didn't know her enough to come forward and say we're missing this person i think maybe it was just a case of somebody who just wanted to like make the case kind of really really well known and then for you know for it to be solved i don't think necessarily that they knew her it's just kind of like this is an awful thing that's happened to this woman and you know we kind of want it to be solved on her behalf we don't know who she is but it's fucking sucks to be her and you know we want justice for for her we'll just call her bella because it's a nice name Exactly, exactly. And I mean, there are insinuations that maybe she was a prostitute 
as well. So maybe it was just members of that community coming together and saying, we want justice, we want representation. Yeah. We don't want this to go unheard. She just, we don't want it to be another another figure. Just another day. Exactly. Maybe, maybe exactly. she was. Maybe she was, I don't know. But I do think that it was clearly a, a sexually motivated murder. Yeah. I don't think she was drunk yeah. and they stuffed her inside a tree and just thought she'd be fine. It's this... <laughs> That's just not what people do when their friends are drunk. No, there's not. <laughs> even if you are, like, even uh, uh, Unit 43, I don't even think they put people in no. trees. Do you, do you know what I <laughs> no. mean? I mean, they... It's not something that is... Like, as far as I can see that has ever been come across before. No. Do, do, do you know what I mean? It, it, the the case is weird because she's in a tree, but I, I've i never heard anybody or any other case or anything on, yeah, she was pissed or put in a tree. Mate, I went to what college with stoners and I can guarantee I've never heard of anybody getting put in a tree when they're drunk. And that's the kind of thing this that a stoner a- would do. Yeah, I mean, we'll try we'll try and kill each other in kind of nice ways, like if you seven sheets to the wind and someone buys you half a pint of whiskey and tells you it's or- apple juice. Yeah. We'll try and do that, but we won't not let you get home safe. Yeah. It's not a thing. I think... It's a real yeah, long stretch, I, that. <laughs> yeah. And I think, again, like I say, it's the, the startings or the middle bit of a story that was concocted by someone. Uh, totally. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's, it's definitely something that's sexual, sexually motivated, uh, especially with the undergarments being in her mouth. Mm-hmm. And she just said, "No, or you have to pay more for that." Yeah. And someone really didn't want to, and unfortunately, a young woman lost their life. Maybe as it was her boyfriend. Maybe it was. Maybe, you I mean, know, she had a fight or something. And, you know, they weren't terrible for her. It's just, it's clearly somebody that, it's clearly a man who. Uh, yeah, of course. <clears throat> it's clearly a man yeah. that knew her or had had dealings with yeah. her in the past. Yeah, totally. And just this time it didn't go well. Got a bit heated. And, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, this 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 is this is this is the way it ended up. Yeah. But but hopefully hopefully maybe if they have a good look around the uni, they can find them bones and. Uh, I told you they went out with the we recycling. Can, we can at least get some closure on this. But like I say, this I don't think this is this is a case that's going to be forgotten. A because it's kind of gone into folklore now, and like I said, the. I think the graffiti is still there up on the Ooh. up on the cenotaph. I think it is. In 2006, they were talking about cleaning it, but I did see an article from 2019 that someone had defaced it. What? Uh, yeah, they crossed... Was it who? Yeah, they crossed who out on it and put her... So it kind of says her, her put Bella, Bella in the, wi- what the, in the witch elm. Pricks. Yeah, I so I don't think they're they're helping the case. Oh my god! But I don't think they've done that much terrible to it. It's, it is I think as far as I'm aware, it is still there, and it is something that is still talked about. Certainly within the area, there's a lecture on YouTube from I think it's Shropshire. Uh, uh, Telford University and it's oh, shut up uh, I never said anything are you talking to the voices again yeah okay. uh, Dr Louise Fenton she from the University of Wolverhampton she's got a thing on YouTube which is uh, it's very in depth uh, about it I've stole a lot of stuff off that what does she but, say Give my sources. She said everything I've just said because I've literally verbatim. Wow. Uh, no, 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 no. But she's, 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 uh, 
she she knows about the local area so she's got a lot of local history in that area and she talks about the Charles Morton case and the Antenant case which were kind of witchcraft in the area uh, so she's been on the ground and she's done a, a lot of uh, research on this as well but if you all watch that it's probably she probably does it a lot better than I've done it but so you uh, should probably yeah. link her video in the description okay I will do. Yeah. I've not stole it. I just listened to it as a reference, <laughs> uh-huh. by the way. Uh-huh. Just saying that. I was. Th- th- look, Wikipedia, one stop shop for me. Read <laughs> uh, up. Yeah. Why go any further? It's all that. <laughs> uh, even if you have to have it, add it yourself. Well, please don't. Three ninety nine for a subscription. Uh, just add stuff in yourself. No. Uh, no. You can't, you can't, you know. It's one of the most, it's one of the hardest places to uh, edit it's stuff for the best. on there. Uh, yeah, of course it is because all, things only stay up for like a few seconds, which is really, which is really good. It, uh, it's not that; it's because I know how you spell definitely, and it's criminal. Wow! There we go. <laughs> dyslexic, right? It's, yeah, dyslexic people on Wikipedia named Ant. It should be banned. On that bombshell. At least run a spell check. This is why I asked you for Google Docs, because WordPad doesn't do it. <laughs> what are you still using Word? Are you from the past? <laughs> Why are you using WordPad? I didn't even think that was part of Windows anymore. Wait, are you still running Windows ninety five? The first the first twenty episodes I was using Notepad. Oh my God. And it really pissed me off that you couldn't fucking cause Everything would just go along in a big line. It'd be uh, like, what? I need to press enter. No, you tick oh, word just wrap. Just have paragraphs. Tick word wrap. Oh my god, you're such an old person. You know what it I'm is? Not Most of our listeners probably don't even know what Notepad and Word Wrap is because <laughs> it oh, hasn't been shit. part of Windows for about twenty years. Whoa, whoa, whoa! WordPad is. Because why am I using it? You're using it right now. Did you download it extra? They don't. No. Oh my god, WordPad is still there. I did not even know it was a thing. You know why? Because I don't use it ever. Because we have Microsoft Word, we have Google Docs, we have Open Office, we have any of the Mac equivalents. I I don't know about because I don't use Mac. Just Open Office. Uh, Look, right. Not paying a subscription to be told how to spell, right? You don't have to pay a subscription to use Google Docs, dickhead. It's free. I know. Yes, that's why I I am starting to use it nowadays. Then, then don't. If, if... And 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 if you look in the Google Drive, there's an article in there that was written just for you. Oh God. It's all in Comic Sans. Oh, I hate you so much. I hate you so much. I'm going to delete it. <laughs> On that bombshell, <laughs> shit. On oh, that bombshell, this has been the MO Podcast with me, Contamation Sand. And me, Anti-Comic Sans Atreya. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we shall see you next time. Bye. Bye. The MO Podcast. The MO Podcast. The MO Podcast. The MO Podcast.